Good afternoon. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Business, Housing, and Zoning Committee for March 26, 2024. I'm Jamal Osman, and I'm the chair of this committee. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this meeting. Council Member Rainville. Present. Cashman. Present. Jenkins is absent. Chowdhury. Present. Vice Chair Ellison. Here. Chair Osman. Present. There are five members present. Let the, ref let the record reflect we have a quorum. I would like to let the public know we, I heard from Councilmember Jenkins, who's not feeling well. Um, that's why she could not join us today. Um, with that, I was going to bring item, a uh, walking item on, on this agenda, but uh, we decided not to. I decided not to, and to give more uh, description of what that was, I'll, I'll call our guest cause, cause member Robin Wansley. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Chair Osman. And so, as you mentioned, both you, uh, myself, as well as Council Member. Chavez and Councilmember Cashman um, had planned to bring a walk on item um, addressing uh, small business financing and making sure that we're getting um, supports out to new and emerging ride shares. Um, in conversations with council leadership, we have learned that the more appropriate place to take up those conversations will be budget, uh, which will be on April 8th, that's a Monday. Um, so we'll be uh, having further conversations with that along with other TNC related resources um, or ride share resources at that point. And also look forward to having more conversations with staff uh, about how we make sure that we're preparing for this transition. So thank you so much for giving me the space to share. Thank you so much, Councilmember Wansley. I would like to uh, move to delete item number two, three, and four from the agenda. This is quasi judicial hearing regarding the renovation of various license due to the outstanding taxes <coughs> owed to the um, Minnesota Department of Revenue. We have been notified that the state, all three entities have resolved the tax issues and no license action is required. All those in favor say aye. Is there any discussion on those items? All those in favor say aye. aye. And those of both say nay. The motion carries and the item two, three, and four are deleted from the agenda. Moving on, we have 14 items on the consent agenda. The first item is for liquor license approval. The second item is 193 liquor license renewal. The third item is three gambling license approval. The fourth item is approving on sale liquor license <coughs> with Sunday sales, unlimited entertainment business license, condition for the basement, 501 Washington Avenue South. The fifth item is approving a contract amendment with Mead Minneapolis for sales and marketing for Minneapolis Convention Center. The sixth item is resolution establishing the African American Heritage Work Group as advisory board to the City Council on Minneapolis and African American History and Cultural Content Study. The seventh item is approving at uh, Morundum of Understanding with Workforce Development Partners for North Minneapolis Career Force Center. The eighth item is resolution approving the budget and continue operation to the MacPhail Center for Music. Item, item nine is authorizing submittal of grant application for the Department of Labor for apprenticeship program. Item 10 is approving a number of affordable housing trust fund award extensions. Item 11 is resolution granting approval for HCHRA to undertake a housing project at 501, 507, 525, and 527 Humboldt Avenue North and 1315 Olsen Memorial Highway through housing revenue bond, as well as approving a city loan for the project. Item 12 is approving agreement with MPRP related to the downtown East Commons. Item 13 is settling a public hearing for April 16 to consider the sale of 2106 and 2110 Ben Avenue. Item 14 is referring to the staff, the subject matter of ordinance relating to the zoning code amending the land use application fees. 
Is there any discussion on the consent agenda? Are there any items that anyone would like to pull? Councilmember Allison. Uh, thank you, Chair Osman. Uh, I'd like to pull item number uh, 15 in our packets here uh, dealing with uh, Olson Court, and I'll ask uh, Director Hansen uh, to just answer brief questions or invite your team up to answer any questions. Um, actually, I'll pull it for discussion and we can we can take up the rest of the consent agenda first. My apologies. Councilmember Rainville. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could, Mr. Chair, if I could please pull uh, number eight, the, the basement uh, liquor license for a separate vote and separate discussion. What number? Eight. Well, I, you know, my numbers aren't matching up with yours. I have a Me different. Either. So I'm, I'm sorry, but no, I, I have it as number eight. It's the basement bar. Okay. All right. Well, come. Is there anyone else? Member Chowdhury. Thank you, uh, Chair Osmond. I just had some questions on the Affordable Housing Trust Fund award extensions, and I think probably members on this body will be able to answer that. I just wanted to note that I had a couple questions. And so if we want to pull it for discussion, I'm happy to, or if I could ask that question now, whatever is appropriate. Yep. Um, we'll take the question first. Okay. Um, is the staff here to discuss? And also next we'll call Councilmember Cashman. Thank you, uh, Chair Osmond. My question is uh, just understanding the extension. I know that we do awards for the from the affordable Ch housing trust fund i'm trying to just understand what an extension means for existing projects hi council member chowdhury i'm carrie goldberg with residential finance so the affordable housing trust fund has uh when we do an award has three years to make use of that ward um, in the last few years due to interest rates and construction costs we've seen projects take a little bit longer than that and so anything outside those three years needs to come before council to extend those wards so that they can still be incorporated into the financing. Thank you, Chair, and thank you so much for coming. Um, just so I understand it well, then this isn't taking any new funding from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. It's just extending the time to spend what's already been awarded. That's correct. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Councilmember Cashman. Thank you. This isn't on the same item. Sure. Um, it's a different item, uh, number nine on mine, which is the contract amendment with, with Meet Minneapolis for sales and marketing of the Minneapolis Convention Center and tourism services for the city. I don't really have any questions for uh, Jeff or Melvin who are here. I just want to thank you so much for your really intentional briefing that you took with me and I think with many of the other council members about our contract amendment and really excited to support this today. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I'm so sorry, I just realized that some of the items numbers are mixed because of the deleted items, but uh, we will take um, all consent agenda except item 15 and eight that Council Member Allison and Rainville will pull out. With that, um, on consent agenda, except item eight and 15, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those um not in favor say nay the item pass now i'll call councilmember allison uh thank you mr chair uh quick questions you know item 15 here does have to do with an item in my ward but uh is also uh, a part of something that I think that myself and a lot of committee members aren't, it's the type of item that we're not as familiar with, which is my understanding is it's uh, a little bit of debt restructuring. Uh, and so I just wanted to get an overview from staff about what this item is, how we got here, and how often we might be seeing things like this. And so uh, uh, we can just take an overview and then maybe if I'll, I'll jump in with a few specific questions as we go along. Great. Uh, thank you, Chair Osman and Councilmember Ellison. Uh, my name is Amy Geisler. I'm the manager of the residential finance team in CPED. Um, and I can speak to your, your questions a little bit. Um, first of all, I think it's helpful to start with remembering that the city has been investing funds in affordable housing preservation and production for decades. And so this means that there are affordable buildings you know, across the city that have existing city mortgages on them um, in place. Uh, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund has been our umbrella program for this work for about the last 20 years, um, but we did make loans prior to having the trust fund in place. 
Um, and we provide long-term deferred funding um, to projects in exchange for long-term affordability commitments um, from them, often 30 years or more. Uh, and deferred means that we don't require payments during the terms of those loans, um, so there's no payments required um, while, the, while the loan is outstanding, um, typically. Um, it's only due upon sale or conversion of a non, to a non-affordable use. Um, and we also almost always do this work in partnership with other funding partners from Hennepin County, uh, Minnesota Housing. What this means is that projects almost always have multiple public mortgages from the city, Hennepin County, and the state on them. Um, and like other infrastructure, housing needs regular maintenance. Um, and so we expect projects to come back to us over time, over decades, um, for additional funding for rehab work. Um, but because we've restricted the rents in those earlier mortgages, those projects don't have reserves or cash flow um, to, to um, be able to support new debt. So, so they come back to the city and the other public funding partners for additional funding. Um, so we look at you know, putting in new loans through the trust fund to finance rehab work, um, but as those projects are approach, approaching closing, we have to do something with that existing city debt. Uh, those projects usually don't have enough property value to support both the old city debt and the new city debt, and so we take a look at um, is there an opportunity for projects to repay some of the old city debt? Um, and in certain circumstances, we sometimes recommend forgiveness um, for, sort of for a portion of that. Um, and so like, like those original uh, funding recommendations that we made years ago, uh, we do this kind of debt analysis in coordination with our funding partners at the county and the state. We're kind of all taking action kind of simultaneously on, the, on these debt actions. So. And right now we're working on a number of projects uh, that, this, uh, that fall into this category where they have debt from decades ago, like the Olson Court Park Plaza project, um, and they're moving towards closing. They have more debt than they can support, um, and so they've, uh, in Olson Court's case, they have come to the city and requested a partial forgiveness of that city debt, um, just the interest portion, so just the accrued interest. And they've made that same request to Hennepin County and the state of Minnesota um, and the Family Housing Fund. Um, and both the county and the state have taken action on that request. Um, to forgive just that accrued interest. Um, the original principle will stay in place on the projects, um, but they are requesting, again, that forgiveness of that accrued interest. So uh, that is what is before you on item 15 for Olson Court um, slash Park Plaza, this, this debt action along with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund Award that we gave in 2022 will enable the substantial rehabilitation of Park Plaza itself, which is over 100 units, um, along with the new construction of an Olson Court project, um, which is 119 new units. Um, so uh, very substantial um, request um, will result in many preserved units and then new units on top of it. Um, and so I think I mentioned this, the state of Hennepin County have already taken action to forgive that accrued interest and that is the request that's before you today to take action on that interest along with um, a request from Hennepin County to give them permission to issue $37 million in bonds for this project within Minneapolis. Thank you. I've got just two short, hopefully short questions. One is, um, you know, how, when you talk about that old debt, uh, how does the old debt on the, on this project um, relate to new potential trust fund awards? Right. Yes. Um, so Chair Osmond, Councilmember Ellison. Uh, so when projects come into us f uh, for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, when they submit an application and they have existing debt on there, um, when we do our trust fund application review, we look at that existing debt and kind of start our assessment at that point. Um, so we're kind of starting our analysis right with that initial um, trust fund application that we receive. Um, but then really over, you know, the life cycle of these projects, you know, one of our other agenda items was to extend some trust fund awards, you know, so it can take several years for these projects to come together. Uh, so we spend several years working with the developer and the other funding partners to kind of analyze that existing debt and figure out um, what is going to be the most feasible structure um, to get them to closing, to kind of address that existing debt, can they support some of it, um, is there cash available to repay any of, it, any of it, you know, sometimes we do see situations like that, uh, but especially in projects that have real deep affordability, you know, there just really isn't, you know, cash available to do that. Uh, and then last question is, um, you know, how often, you, you mentioned that we've got this, you know, we've got these units 30, 40, 30, 40 years old, um, you know, how often do we think we're going to be seeing, uh, as we're sort of hitting that 30 to 40 year mark, how often are we going to be seeing, you know, requests for debt forgiveness or debt restructures on these older projects? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair Osman, uh, Councilmember Ellison. Um, so we're, we're going to start seeing more of these. Um, and our team has done, we have brought forward requests like this periodically over the past 
five or six years. I can think of maybe one or two, um, but we're going to start seeing more of them um, because, to your point, you know, we have projects that are that are aging. Um, you know, and we've put debt into them into the past, and they have needs. They're going to be coming forward. Um, so I would estimate at this point that we will see, you know, maybe four to six kind of similar projects that are going to be coming forward before you within the next six to nine months. That's all my questions. Thank you so much. Um, I'll see if my colleagues have other questions, but I just wanted us to get a little bit of a, a sense of what this is, uh, since we're going to be seeing a little bit more of it before the before our committee, uh, and I want to make sure that committee members really understand uh, like what we're voting on, and um, and you know. So thank you so much for the overview. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Allison. Uh, I'll move that item 15. I'll move item 15. For approval, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and the motion carries. And now for item eight, Councilmember uh, Rainville. Uh, thank you. So um, I, I have uh, uh, comments for my colleagues and uh, for Ms. Lingo about the basement bar liquor license. I did hold a community meeting that was attended by about 85 people. And I'm just uh, wondering, Amy, I know you had mentioned that as a uh, 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 Director Lingo, as a result of that, you had uh, suggested some conditions on that license. Could you maybe inform us of those conditions, please? Bill, um, after that meeting, we did have a discussion. I had a discussion with the applicant, and we had them downgrade from a general entertainment license request to a limited entertainment license request. And the conditions that we have them signed are um, the licensee agrees to prohibit any current or former member of the Agora LLC from working in a managed position of the establishment or acting in a managerial capacity on behalf of the establishment. That is the prior applicant that was recently denied. The licensee agrees to provide and utilize uniforms for all employees and the uniforms will be worn in a professional manner during all hours open to the public. The licensee shall at all times keep an accurate occupancy count and immediately share such figures upon the request to any official of the City of Minneapolis. And the licensee will close at 1 a.m. for the first three months of operations. If there are no hours related violations at that time, the license hours will be adjusted to a 2 a.m. closure. So due to the concerns that were brought up to the committee or to, uh, at the community meeting, they were concerned about the hours. There is an establishment that in that same building that has a 2 a.m., but they were concerned about the 2 a.m. So um, in the discussion with the applicant, we have broached the earlier closing time in order for them to get up to speed and to assuage the concerns of the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. So I, I'm going to be voting no on this. I was at the community meeting. I'm really concerned. I, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that no former applicants will be allowed. But to me, this is just uh, a deceptive way to get uh, the past licensed applicant that was revoked to get it approved this time. It's They didn't even change the name of it. That's how uh, odd this is. I'm really, really concerned about our lack of police officers to serve uh, outside of the entertainment district. Uh, this, this venue seats 250 people. It's a large, large venue, and I just don't have the faith that it's going to be held to safe to be the entertainment to be held in a safe fashion as do all the citizens in that area that came to the meeting and all, all the phone calls I have. So going forward today, I'm going to vote no. I would encourage you to vote no. And we have to start limiting uh, how we allow these bar licenses outside of our, our core entertainment district. We just do not have the police force to patrol that. Thank you. Councilmember Ellison. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair Osman. Uh, I'm not familiar with this establishment. I'm not sure what happened. Sounds like maybe a lot happened. Um, but also staff, my understanding is that staff is recommending the approval of this application and I trust the staff has done their fair share of due diligence. I'd love a briefing on this item before we get to full counsel. I don't need to sit up here and ask questions that I don't know the answer to uh, right here, right now, uh, especially operating with so little information. But um, between now and then, I'd, I'd love if my office could get a briefing on, on maybe the situation here. Uh, and I'm going to actually see if we can forward without recommendation. Uh, not prepared to vote for this because of the concerns of my colleague. And I want to 
respect the fact that, you know, this is an area you represent, uh, uh, Councilmember Rainville, uh, but also, you know, I do trust staff to do their due diligence and to make sure that these establishments are operating lawfully. Uh, I have to, I, I believe that staff's probably done that here, but would love, would love a chance to ask a few more questions. So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to make that motion, uh, for us to forward without recommendation. Happy to okay. take any questions from my colleagues. Councilmember Cashman. Thank you, Chair Osmond. Thank you, Councilmember Ellison. I would like to sit in on that briefing. If possible, we could do that together. I'm curious how your negotiations went between the, you know, how you kind of discussed the con conditions of their license and how we might be able to make those kinds of negotiations, you know, easier beforehand with community and facilitate the conversations and working out those details. So it sounds like you did a great job with coming to some compromises but I would love to sit in on that briefing as well and learn more. Allison, Councilman Allison. Well, one last thing I just wanted to say is just, you know, I 100% I, I agree with Councilmember Rainville that these, we've got to make sure that our businesses, especially our entertainment businesses, are 100% accountable. Um, I don't know that we can, nightlife has to be able to exist in the city uh, and, and, these, and these institutions have to be able to hold themselves accountable, the safety of their patrons, the safety of the community, the safety of their employees should be on them. Uh, and I don't know that we can be demanding that that be subsidized by, you know, police, police, our police recruitment efforts here. Those exist. We're going to keep doing them. We're going to still, you know, have that conversation about public safety, um, but we 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 can't sort of wait on that uh, in order to have a, a, a nightlife. And we've got to find other mechanisms to hold these organizations accountable. Uh, hopefully, staff has found some of those mechanisms. I'm excited for the briefing, and Councilmember Cashman, 100% welcome in, that, in on that briefing. Uh, but you, you know, but I want to caution us to say, hey, we can't have this these types of things until we have this other thing. It's not the police's job to be private security to these businesses. It's their job to protect and serve the neighborhoods at large. And so it's these businesses' job to make sure that they have adequate security, have an adequate account of, of, of the law, and that they're following it. So, you know, I just wanted to, to, to name that. Councilman Moranville. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And as always, Councilman Rallison, you are so wise and your life experience speaks to you. You're, you're correct. It is upon the business, and I do not have faith in that business. In fact, you have a have a, a person who wants to uh, get a license to operate in the city of Minneapolis, and he didn't even come here today. So that's what he thinks about my opinion, perhaps your opinion. So just want to note that for the record. He's not here. Councilmember Chowdhury. Thank you, Chair Osmond. <clears throat> I really appreciate the motion to forward without recommendation, and I appreciate Council Member Rainville kind of like alerting us to some of the concerns that he ha he has. Um, the hesitation that I have around moving without recommendation is should this be a, a conversation that we just delay a cycle if the body is concerned and if we want to have like maybe more of a public forum to discuss the questions that we all have. Um, I My calendar is a little... Uh, Packed, and so I don't know if I would have availability for a briefing. I just want to just note that, like, our discussion kind of maybe um, means that we don't take this up in the next council cycle and give give some time for it. So I just wanted to put that offering out there. That's not me making a motion. Would love to discuss with the body. Councilmember Allison, uh, I'd love to get uh, an opinion from staff. I'm I, as far as the delay or forwarding without recommendation. I'm pretty. Um, I'm sort of uh, neither here nor there on that. Um, I'm happy to sort of move at this pace. I'm, I'm totally comfortable getting a briefing between now and full council. Um, if it's, you know, it'd be, it'd be great if staff could help us, you know, are there some considerations that we have to yeah. take in? Uh, yeah. Thank you, Chair Osmond, Council Member Ellison. Councilmember Ch uh, Chowdhury. Um, I am available to do a briefing. We can also do a briefing memo if that would be um, easier for those who aren't available. This license has been in process for quite some time, so I know the applicant is interested in moving forward, but um, if you did want to delay it, we could probably make a case for that as well. I know that they want to get up and running, but they do want to be in good standing, so I will leave that to your decision, but I am available to do a briefing and a memo as well. Thank you, and I see the uh, our city attorney has 
comment. Thank you, committee members. Um, I would note that next week is an off week for the council yep. cycle, so, so the full okay. council meeting is not till the following week. Uh, there's not a specific deadline. It's not like a 60-day rule under a zoning matter. However, I think um, if there is availability to um, kind of tie together the loose ends and provide some briefings before the full council meeting in accord with due process I think that would be the most advisable track and I can certainly my office can be involved in that meeting as well and I just want to say that um, as of now I'm unaware of any reason uh, to uh, deny this license all right um, well with, with that I will um I'll ask one last, not that I'm trying to defer this decision, but I'll, I'll ask Councilmember uh, Rainville if he has any preference. I know you'll be voting against this item no matter what, but um, if you had any preference to delay or forward without recommendation, I'm happy to, uh, to hear that and consider that. Well, well, I agree with Councilmember Chowdhury that we should delay it one cycle so we can have fully vet this. And, and uh, it would be great to uh, have the applicant at least show up so we can learn of his interest from him. Well, then noted. I'll, I'll rescind my previous motion then, and I will make a new motion to delay this item uh, one cycle. Uh, and I don't know the date on that, uh, our next committee meeting, but I'm sure the clerks can, can uh, pass me an assist here. Oh. If it's delayed one cycle, it would not be April 16th. It would be... Yes, the next oh, the meeting of this committee is April 16th. Gotcha. Got it. All right, so delayed to this committee, April 16th. Um, so, yeah, that works for me. Councilmember Chowdhury. Thank you, Chair Osman. I'll second that, and I'll just uh, put in a comment that I, I think if the applicant wants to be in good standing as a council member voting on it, I would appreciate their presence. Um, and I think... This is a good example of us being able to do some due diligence um, together as a body when uh, a member brings it forward. So I'm happy to second. Um, okay. Um, with that, uh, Councilmember Allison to delay this item for two cycles, right? One cycle. One cycle, <coughs> April 16. All those favor say aye. Aye. And all those opposed say nay. Uh, the item carries, and the motion um, is approved. Um, with that, our next item is a joint consent item with Minneapolis Community Development Agency Operating Committee to authorize to authorize an amendment to the Convention Center. Hotel. Mr. Chair, I'm so sorry yes. to interrupt. I think you've maybe missed item number one on the agenda. No, we're still no. working on the consent agenda, I believe. Yes. Con it's a joint consent item. I apologize. Thank you. Sure. Our next item is a joint consent item with Minneapolis Community Development Agency Operating Committee to authorize amendment to the Convention Center Hotel Parking Ram Lease to refer this matter to the MCDA Board of Commissioners. I'm going to call... On CBA Director Eric Hansen to explain more about the relationship between the MCDA and the City of Minneapolis, the City Council and the City of Minneapolis. Thank you, Chair Osman and committee members. Um, today you'll be um, convening as the Operating Committee of the Minneapolis Community Development Agency, or the MCDA. The MCDA was the development entity for the city prior to the creation of uh, the Community Planning Economic Development Department, or CPED, in 2003. Um, we still keep it as a legal entity for, for very limited purposes, and this is one of those purposes, an ownership of a, a parking ramp in downtown Minneapolis. Um, there's other financing programs that the MCDA can deploy in certain circumstances that the city can't, and we use that uh, MCDA. So you're on the board of commissioners as well as a member of the city council, and you operate as the operating committee, the full board or the full council operates as the board of commissioners and so this would also be taken up at the next city council meeting which I do believe would then be an annual meeting which you would pick your um, the MCDA's um, uh, uh, president and vice president are there any questions 
See no one else, I'll approve this. Uh, I will approve of authorizing amendment to the lease and referring the matter of to the MCDA Board of Commissioners on April 11. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and the motion carries. Our next public, um, our next item is public hearing uh, to approve on sale wine with strong beer and limited entertainment to license for Duat Cafe and Wine. We'll first have a presentation from his staff and then we'll open the floor to comments. Mr. Joseph. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair Osmond and committee members. Uh, I'm Joseph Olson, licensed inspector with licenses and consumer services. Today I'm presenting an application from Duet Wine and Coffee Incorporated, doing business as Duet Wine and Coffee located at 1477 West Lake Street in Ward 10. Duet Wine and Coffee opened in January and holds a restaurant license at this location. The applicant is requesting an on-sale wine with strong beer and limited entertainment license. Duet Wine and Coffee has requested limited, en limited entertainment and will occasionally have live musical performances by solo artists or small bands. The restaurant is located on the ground floor of Daymark Apartment Homes and features a bar and perimeter seating in the East Lobby for 37 guests. The menu features coffee, pastries, sandwiches, and salads. Duet is open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. daily. On March 4th, public hearing notices were sent to property owners within 600 feet of the premises. Notices were also sent to the East Bidet Makaska Neighborhood Association, the Uptown Business Association, and Council Member Aisha Shugtai in Ward 10. We have, we have received one comment from the community supporting this business. There have been zero complaints, 311 calls, police calls, or any other significant issues concerning this business. Uh, the License and Consumer Services Division recommends an approval of an on-sale wine with strong beer and limited entertainment license. Uh, this concludes my presentation. At this time, I will stand for any comments or questions. Thank you so much for that presentation. Thanks. Are there any questions for anyone? With that, I will open uh, the public hearing and call Joe Musenki. Yes, Celia too. Yep. Each of you will have two minutes. Um, we just had an opportunity to, to uh, start a, a coffee shop inside of Daymark. They had a, a Gray Fox before, but because of the COVID, the riots, everything else, I think they had a hard time staying in business. So we saw the opportunity. We took over. Another business partner works a, at 8 to 5, so he's not here right now. But she had experience. We my other business partner and myself had uh, prior business experience. We decided to just take the opportunity, make something nice for Uptown. I um, mean, our place isn't as comfortable as most coffee shops, but it's nice. It's like a it's like a lobby. They have big windows. We have a skating rink that's uh, pretty popular. The only year that we ever wanted to be cold, it wasn't. Uh, we thought we'd do well. <laughs> she actually did an Instagram post. They got like 650,000 plays. So who knew that people really want to ice skate. But again, you know, we have entertainment and it's not even about making money as much as it, it, it's about people walking by, seeing the entertainment, smiling, being happy. That's what we're, we're trying to do. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us here today. Um, Duet Coffee, we believe in serving exceptional coffee and strive to create a warm and welcoming space. Our mission was to provide a space for people to gather, unwind, and enjoy quality beverages and conversation. And our commitment to Uptown extends beyond our cups. Duet is a hub for local artists, um, musicians, and entrepreneurs. We regularly host events and provide a platform to showcase talented local artists. Um, and we are invested in giving life back to the city, and this license will allow us to better serve our community and continue to be a valued asset to the neighborhood. Thank you so much for your comment and thank you for um, doing business in our neighborhood. I'm super excited to support this, but uh, now I'm going to proceed to close the public hearing. Are there any 
council members who would like to make a comment. Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for believing in Minneapolis, investing in Minneapolis. I, I'm so excited to approve this. I'll be voting for it, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I will uh, see no one else to speak. I will um, motion to uh, approve for this item. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it, and the motion carries. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. All right, our next item is regarding, <clears throat> regarding the fall 2023 um, Brown Field grant for deed, the Met Council and Hennepin County. I'll invite Kevin Carl from CBA to give us a presentation. Chair Osmond, members of the committee, my name is Kevin Carroll. Uh, I work in the Business Development Division of CPAD. Um, you will see in a typical year four to six staff reports re regarding Brownfield grants. Um, it's typically kind of a low profile type thing, it kind of flies under the radar, but there's millions of dollars involved every year and our communication staff suggested to us recently that it might not be a bad idea to come and give you a little overview about what Brownfield grant funding is so that when you see these uh, staff reports in the future you'll have maybe a better understanding. And with your consent I'll do it in the form of maybe posing a couple of questions to myself, questions that you might ask of me and then I'll answer them for you. Um, and the first question is, what is a brownfield? It's a term that many people don't hear very often. Um, a brownfield is basically a, a lot or a parcel or a piece of property that's either known to be contaminated in some way or suspected of being contaminated. Um, and the best distinction, I think, is between brownfield development and greenfield development. If you're a property owner or a developer in rural Minnesota or a <clears throat> maybe a smaller greater Minnesota city or a third ring suburb, the development you do is probably greenfield development. Um, you're probably developing on land that's never had anything on it before. It's been a field, it's been a prairie. But Minneapolis has such a long industrial legacy that almost every site that's developed or redeveloped in Minneapolis has some amount of contamination on it, either because of some business that was operated that, at that site or in some cases the contamination migrates in from nearby parcels. Um, so, you know, the common offenders in the past have been gas stations with leaking gas tanks, um, plating facilities, um, um, dry cleaners. Um, so there's lots of contaminated sites in Minneapolis. The next question I think would be, who are the Brownfield grantors? Who are you going to see referenced in the staff reports that you get from me? Um, the three primary grantors are the state of Minnesota through its Department of Employment and Economic Development. We just call those deed grants. Um, the Met Council has um, brownfield funding. It's typically, they're called TBRA grants. It's from their tax base revitalization account. There's always a, there's a lot of alphabet soup here with this type of stuff. And Hennepin County has a grant program called the ERF or um, Environmental Response Fund. When you see staff reports from me, they'll typically involve those three grantors because those three grantors conduct two grant rounds per year Many years ago, they coordinated their schedules. Instead of having completely separate schedules, they said, let's have everybody apply to us on May 1 and November 1 of every year. So every six months, there's, there's a grant round involving those three grantors. There are a couple of other grantors that you won't see because um, they don't require city involvement. Um, there's a nonprofit organization called Minnesota Brownfields that awards grants. Um, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has some grant funding. Um, but the city's involvement in that is, is um, less than with the other grantors. Um, the next question is, um, why is brownfield grant funding important? Um, it's critical to many development projects because most lenders don't want to provide construction financing for a site that's contaminated. They fear either they're going to get associated in some way with that contamination or their borrower is going to have problems in the future that would affect their ability to make their loan payments. So not only are they worried about that, but they also don't like awarding um, money or um, loaning money to clean up contaminated sites. They basically say to the developers, you show us the site is contaminated, or you show us that you figured out a way to clean up the contamination, and then we'll loan you the construction financing that you need. So many, many Minneapolis projects would not proceed at all, um, or would not proceed as, as economically without Brownfield grant funding. Um, maybe the next question is, what types of things will Brownfield grant funding cover? It basically falls into two categories. There are investigation funds and cleanup funds. 
Investigation funds are funds that can be awarded for things like a phase one environmental site assessment where they kind of review all the records that exist and aerial photos from the 1930s, et cetera. They kind of see what the history of the property is because that helps people understand what the contamination sources might have been. Um, it'll pay for a phase two environmental site assessment, which is the actual boots on the ground work where they go out and do soil borings, take them back to the lab, analyze them, figure out what's in the soil. Um, investigation funds will pay for the preparation of a document called a RAP. It's a response action plan. It's a document that the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency requires when a site intends to clean up a site. They'll say, show me your RAP. Let me know what you intend to do. Um, and investigation funding will also pay for hazardous materials survey. Uh, much redevelopment occurs in existing buildings, homes, commercial structures. Many of the older ones in Minneapolis have asbestos in them in various places, lead-based paint. You have to send an expert in and take samples, test them, and figure out how much contamination you have. So those are all types of investigation things that grant funding can pay for. The cleanup funding can pay for, in most cases, soil cleanup. You just dig out the stuff that's bad and you haul it away and dump it someplace. Um, it'll also pay for remediating a contaminated building. You can go in and get out the asbestos and the lead-based paint. And in some cases, if you're building a new structure on site that has um, vapors penetrating from surrounding properties, uh, it'll pay for putting in a vapor mitigation system to sort of route those vapors up through the ceiling and out and not, you know, cause health problems for the, uh, for the residents of the building. Um, how often is Brownfield grant funding offered? Twice a year, as I mentioned. Um, the staff report you have today is a staff report that uh, basically asks you and the council to accept grants that were awarded in the November 1, 2023 grant round. Um, many people ask how much money is involved. Um, DEED offers in every round about $4 million worth of grant funding. The Met Council offers about $2.5 million. Hennepin County is more variable, but I would say they average probably a, a million and a half, and that's per grant round. So you double that per year. So for D, it's about $8 million a year. For the Met Council, it's about $5 million. Um, and for Hennepin County, probably about 3 or $4 million. Um, and I've been doing this work for this. is the 19th year I've done Brownfield Grant work for the city of Minneapolis. Over that span, we've typically averaged, we've gotten probably 25% of the money awarded by DEED, about 50% of the money awarded by the Met Council, and probably 80 to 85% of the money awarded by Hennepin County. So we've been pretty successful. Um, and in terms of how much um, we've actually gotten for the city, the average over the last 18, 19 years has probably been five to six million dollars a year. I think our high point was 12 million in one year. Um, and then when the economy's slower, you have COVID problems and supply chain problems, it drops a little bit. Um, I think uh, last year we were probably in the four to five million dollar range. So there's a significant amount of money that comes through to help Minneapolis projects. Um, you may be wondering what the city's role is. If the money comes from other entities, why is the city involved? Um, we're involved because, for the most part, all these grantors require that the applications technically come from the jurisdiction that the project is located in. So if it's a Minneapolis project, DEED and the Met Council um, expect the applications to actually come from the city of Minneapolis. We don't write the applications. The developers and their consultants write the applications, but we have to review them and approve them and then we submit them, and then the money is awarded to the city on behalf of these projects. It, it's a conduit sort of transaction. And that's the way the money flows also. It gets awarded to the city, the developer does the work, they give us the receipts and invoices, we pass them back to the grantor, the grantor approves it, they send the money to the city, we pass the money back to the developer. So we're in the middle. Um, and these grantors see the city's role as not only just a paperwork shuffling, but they see us as the entity that has to review the projects to make sure that they're number one eligible. They don't want us submitting applications for projects that aren't eligible for their funds. And secondly, in the last five or ten years especially, they're really emphasizing project readiness. They don't want to award money to a project that either doesn't go forward at all or gets delayed or doesn't go forward on the timetable that's outlined in the application. So they expect the city to do some vetting. Um, their view is that when the application comes to them from the city, we've reviewed it. We've determined that they've got all or most of their financing, they've gotten their land use approvals, that there's neighborhood support for the project, um, and that the city supports it. They don't want to award money to a project without knowing that the city supports it, which is why they want a resolution. So when you see me, you know, twice per grant round, the first time you see me, not in person probably, but through my report, uh, the first report is seeking your permission to submit certain applications to them. 
Uh, they have to see a resolution of support from the Minneapolis City Council before they will award any money to any project in Minneapolis. And then when the funds are awarded, then I have to come back to this committee and to the council and get the grants formally accepted. They will not sign a grant agreement with the city um, until the city council indicates that they're in favor of the money. Um, and, and frankly, that's why you don't see me very often, because these are often un, uncontroversial, non-controversial projects. Everybody's in favor of cleaning up contaminated sites in Minneapolis. So um, that's why they're often on consent. Um, so the city's role is not only uh, to promote these grant programs and get information out to the development community about what's available, but we're also the advisors, the facilitators. Uh, we review and edit the grant applications to make them as strong as possible. Um, that's why the city's had a, a pretty good record of success uh, in this realm with all the grantors, because we help people as much as we can. And one of the final things I'll say is that one of the recent changes, I think, just in the last couple of years, is the amount of time and attention that we're devoting to try to help new and emerging developers understand the system. Because frankly, it's kind of complex, and there's lots of steps. And new and emerging developers have probably never been exposed to these terms or these procedures before. So um, my view is that we as, I'm not an engineer, but you know, I've been do doing this for 19 years, so there are things I can do to help them understand you know, which are the best grantors to apply to. Should you be in this round or the next round? You know, how to, how to package your application in the way to generate the greatest amount of success. So we see that sort of facilitation advisor role as being important. So um, those are the questions that I had for myself and my answers. Um, on today's agenda, you've got a fairly typical um, staff report regarding a round in which there were um, 12 grants awarded by these three grantors to 10 uh, Minneapolis projects. The reason there's more grants than projects is because you can apply to one, two, or all three of the grantors. Um, it's about $4.3 million worth of funding. Um, there were a total of 10 projects, seven housing projects, two commercial projects, and one park project. Um, and that's a fairly typical mix. When I started doing this work in 2006, it was almost all light industrial, heavy industrial commercial projects. Over time, it's progressed to be more and more housing related and more and more affordable housing because several years ago, the city council adopted a requirement that um, if you want to seek brownfield grant funding and you have a housing project, you have to have at least 20% of the units affordable at 60% AMI. Because mm -hmm. um, in most cases, the market rate projects you know, don't need as much help as the affordable projects. So a lot of them go through the system. So what we're asking today is your support for and approval of um, these seven grants that were awarded to these Minneapolis projects. And uh, I hope I haven't talked longer than what you wanted or needed, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Carl, for that presentation. I do have a question. I mean, I'll just give you maybe like two questions. Um, do we have an estimation of how many um, contaminated partials are out there, like estimation in the city of Minneapolis? And um, is it mostly a private-owned or public-owned lens? And the last one is how would um, someone know that their land is contaminated uh, and what's available for small owned family houses that are might be uh, uh, might be contam contaminated for that uh, can they apply this kind of grant sounds like your presentation it's mostly um, big projects but um, what's available for small family owned business homes so your first question was interesting to me because when I started doing this work in 2006, that was my first question. I, I said, you know, I was in the office for a week or two, and I said, where is the map of the contaminated properties in Minneapolis? I thought, you know, there would be something like that. There really isn't. Um, and the reason for that is that contamination is often suspected, but it's usually not confirmed until someone actually goes out onto the site and does some testing. Um, there, there are probably you know, hundreds, maybe even thousands of parcels in Minneapolis that are contaminated, but no one really knows for sure because there's a house sitting on it or a business sitting on it that's not being developed or redeveloped. The redeveloped. There's no need to dig into the ground and figure out what's there. Um, what I typically tell people is that if you have a, a structure in Minneapolis that's, that's more, that was built before 1960, um, uh, or if you um, are located anywhere near the downtown area, or if there are any commercial businesses anywhere near you, your site is probably contaminated in some way, either soil contamination, heavy metals, petroleum, um, or there's contamination in the building, asbestos or lead-based paint. I encourage everybody 
to get their properties tested. And I tell them, if you come to me soon enough, and if the timing is right, in most cases I can help you find investigation funding so that you don't have to pay the cost of investigating your property. Uh, that's a long answer to a short question, but um, I guess the bottom line is that uh, there's, there's really no way to know definitively which properties are contaminated until some testing is done. Uh, as to your question about um, uh, what types of properties, uh, public properties versus private properties, et cetera, can get grant funding, virtually any site is eligible for contamination cleanup funding. Um, Minneapolis, as I understand it, has an inventory of five or 600 city-owned sites. Some of them may be contaminated. Um, we're talking about in the upcoming round, which is the May 1 grant round, submitting an application to the Met Council for a new scattered site investigation program that they have. And if we do apply and if funds are awarded to the city, the city can then use that money to investigate its own properties when they're getting ready to be sold or redeveloped. So that's an exciting development. I'm, I'm personally excited about that because it's, a, it's a, an option, a grant funding option that we've never had. Um, did that answer most of your question? Yes. Um, thank you. So there are resources out there for people to um, testing resources? Yes. The, the investigation money, frankly, is easier to get because you don't have to prove that you're ready to actually redevelop the property. There's a lower threshold, uh, a lower bar to clear. It's harder to get the cleanup funding because, you know, in all candor, all these programs that I've mentioned, the DEED program, the Met Council program, the Hennepin County program, they're called contamination cleanup programs, but they're really almost more economic development programs in the sense that they usually get more applications than they can fund, so they score and rank all the projects. And they score and rank them on factors like how many new jobs are being created, how many jobs are being retained. When the new project is done, how much are you increasing the market value of the property? How much are the property taxes going up? How many new housing units are you creating? So when you have a scoring system like that, it favors the bigger projects. Mm. You know, and if you've got you know, a, um, a two-story, four-unit apartment building, and you need cleanup funding because you've got contamination, it's a little more challenging to get it because you're competing against maybe a, a 200 unit apartment building. Um, so that's where the, the staff help comes in and trying to figure out, you know, what's the best time to apply? How do we position this? Which grantor do we go to? I mean, I, I'm the show me the money guy. They come to me and I try to find them the best possible source. And we're not always successful, but more often than not, we are. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilmember Rainville, do you have a question? Councilmember Allison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Carroll, just wanted to thank you for this presentation. Uh, you know, I think this was like one of the first, uh, when I was a first time council member, I was like one of the first things where I was like, what is this? What is this exactly? And got a similar presentation as this and um, was around when we added the requirement for affordable housing projects. And um, just want to thank you for this work. It is really important. There's, there's the big policy around environmental you know, review and environmental health and all that kind of stuff. And that stuff is, can be really attractive and it's fun. And this is just the day to day. Like this is the day to day of how we're making sure that sites are clean. It's the day to day of making sure that uh, affordable housing projects aren't being built in, um, uh, you know, contaminated soil. Uh, is infirm soil part of this as well, right? Uh, soil that it, it doesn't pay for soil stabilization. If got you've it. got geotechnically bad soil, it can't pay for that. But okay. often the geotechnically bad soil is also contaminated. Got so. it. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so, yeah, so making sure that our projects are, are, are built uh, correctly. And I think a lot of, you know, certainly uh, I see that there's a project in Harrison here. And I know that Harrison uh, neighborhood has seen a lot of brownfield remediation um, and is better off for it. So just wanted to thank you for the presentation and thank you for your work uh, and for being sort of the due diligence in this process. Uh, and, uh, and no questions but again thank you for the presentation and uh, and for your for being so thorough thank you Ms. Carl I will I see no one up oh, Councilmember Chowdhury thank you Chair Osmond I just also kind of wanted to echo what uh, Councilmember Ellison said I'm a new council member so this is my first time getting the Brownfield presentation and I want to just say thank you for your work and you talked uh, perfect amount. It was really useful uh, for me. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a project, um, an affordable housing project here that's listed in my ward. And so as things happen there and I get questions, I look forward to sharing about what I learned here. So just thank you for the information. If I have any follow-up questions down the line, I know exactly who to reach out to. And thanks for coming before the committee. Well, that was one of the goals today. And I encourage all of you, as you start talking with people about new projects, 
You know, they're, they're often thinking about things other than contamination, but it's, in my view, it's important to consider that right at the outset because far too often I get people who come to me and they, they come to me like the day after a grant application deadline, and I say, well, maybe I can get you money, but you're going to have to wait six months for the next round. So you can't start talking about this stuff too early. And if you encourage people to, you know, call me up, you know, I've, my personal cell phone number has been on every email I've, sent, email I've sent for the last 19 years. You know, call me weekends. It doesn't matter. It, it, it saves me work if I can get to them at an early stage and help them out at the earliest possible time. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. I'll uh, see none. I will move approval for this item. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. And this item is approved. Um, see no further business before us with no objection. I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you so much.